Greetings. This is the 32nd message on the Welsh Calvinistic Methodist, and it's part 8 on the great doctrine of assurance and salvation. Now, I want to remind you that the Welsh Methodists were a very strong and healthy Christian community, and they really reflect the qualities of the Reformers and the Puritans. So, they really emphasize justification by faith, new birth in Jesus Christ. They, they proclaimed the gospel boldly um, when others did not. They stood for truth. And they really emphasized the doctrine of assurance of salvation. And I think that's one of the reasons why they were such healthy Christians. They were very holistic, if you will, in understanding and reading and applying uh, what God was communicating to them through his word. So this is likely our final message on this great doctrine, but I do want to encourage everyone to read the four set sermons by Reverend Ralph Erskine themselves. It's titled uh, Law, Death, Gospel Life. That's the short title, (laughs) Law, Death, Gospel Life. And I think it's a set of sermons that should be read multiple times. If you Google it, I believe you'll find a PDF for free online, but you could also buy the six volume series, which I highly recommend, the six sets, I'm sorry, um, of Ralph Erskine's complete works, highly recommend it. Now, this week we're going to look at this, and hopefully this will be perhaps one of the shortest messages um, ever published by myself, and it's going to look at this question. What's our temperament? Are we gospel-centered? Are we legalistic? In other words, Do we have a gospel attitude or a legalistic attitude? What's the condition of our spirit? Do we have a gospel spirit or a legal spirit? Now, my bias, when I look around what has happened to us, I'm talking about professing Christians now. I'm talking about Christians who are faithfully attending weekly services and actively involved in ministries is based on personal observations and what I hear from pastor conferences and I look at uh, the the surveys and the questions that people are asking and the way people are living and the struggling, my bias is the vast majority of professing Christians have a very legalistic temperament. But it doesn't have to be that way. And uh, in this week's message, I'll, I'll, I'll show you the difference between a legalistic temperament and a gospel temperament. So we don't have to stay this way. And what I would say is the reason why we have a very legal temperament, the way I would put it is, um, it's not just focusing on ourselves, which is true, or focusing on our works, which is true, or behavior. But we are very performance-based, very performance-based, very performance-oriented. And that, as a result, uh, causes a very legalistic temperament, sadly, within the Christian community. Um, there are times uh, in the same sermon, mind you, multiple times, where the preacher might be sharing a gospel temperament, only go to a legalistic temperament, back to a gospel temperament, and to finish up with a legalistic temperament. And you're leaving the the, the sermon going, what am I supposed to do with this? And that's that whole bridge to nowhere. That's the going around the Ferris wheel and never ending. Oh my goodness, I'm not getting anywhere, right? And uh, that I think is the bottleneck. That's the that's the barrier, if you will. So let's. I'm going to give you uh, just two simple examples, and then and then a right conclusion. So first, I want to show you a legal temperament, and we find it in Luke's Gospel. Chapter 5, verse 8. Now, Peter, after seeing uh, this great uh, catch of fish um, and his reaction to it after Jesus tells them to go out and put down their nets, says the following. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Let me read it again. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, 
I've already given you the answer, because I said I was going to look at the legalistic temperament first, or spirit, or attitude, worldview, however you may want to look at it. But, but what's wrong with this, you might be asking yourself. Is there anything wrong that he fell down at Jesus' knees? No. Is there anything wrong when he said, I'm a sinful man, O Lord? No. It's this, depart from me. That's a legalistic temperament. Depart from me. I'm a sinful man, O Lord. The gospel temperament would say, Lord, stay with me because I am a sinful man. That's the gospel temperament. See, there are some forms of legalism that are really kind of easy to spot, right? The rich young ruler, Lord, I've kept all of these things, you know, <laughs> since my youth, you know. The, the, the Pharisee who's saying to the Lord, Lord, thank you for not making me like that sinner in the corner there that's weeping, you know. Thank you, Lord, for making me better than other people. There are legalistic attitudes, and, and those are definitely a problem, and they show themselves all the time. Um, but this one is probably a little bit surprising to you. It's a legalistic temperament. Why? Because Peter is saying, Lord, I am so bad, you know. I am such a sinner. You have to depart from me. I admit it's a very humble statement, but it's a legalistic t statement. I do not measure up, O Lord, so you need to depart from me. That's legalism. And there is, um, in my view, there is no justifying of it. We need to accept it for what it is. And Jesus will even go on to tell Peter, you don't need to be afraid anymore, Peter. I'm doing something within your life. You don't need to be afraid anymore. You don't need to ask me to leave, Peter. Yes, that is not a gospel temperament. That's a legalistic temperament. I don't measure up, O oh Lord, leave me. Now you might ask me, well, John, can you prove that out a little bit further? Sure. Let's look at a gospel temperament. And this is a, we got a whole, we got a whole chapter of it in Psalms 51. The psalmist says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sins, he says. And he'll go on, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast, verse 11, Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. That is, is a gospel temperament. <laughs> That's a gospel spirit, a gospel attitude, a gospel worldview. <laughs> you see, you see the same humility, but what is the result? Lord, I, 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 I need you. I need you. I, I, if, if you don't do this work, O oh Lord, within me, I, I'm a, I'm helpless. If you don't walk right alongside by, beside me, if I don't have your spirit within me, O oh Lord. I'm, I'm lost. See, Psalm 51 is a gospel temperament. Luke 5.8 is a legalistic temperament. Now, this legalistic temperament very might be, well, you know, it can be a whole variety of issues. It could be a condition of the heart. It could be a lack of information. Because again, and I agree with this, many pastors say that if you read a verse in it, agrees with your thinking immediately you're perhaps perhaps misunderstanding the verse because again you know there's the scripture that says you know what seems right to man may just simply will lead him to destruction right god's ways you've heard a pastor say this a billion times god ways god's ways are not our ways his thoughts are not our thoughts you know who can understand the mind of god and so it gets back to this thing of the, this feeling that says the gospel is simply too true to be, you know it's simply it's too good to be true you know and what is the gospel now well, i want to remind you again it is a proclamation it is a declaration from heaven it's not made up by man it comes from heaven by god that lost 
self-destructing creatures called sinners can receive salvation in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God calls on mankind to repent and to believe in His Son. Believe in His Son's atoning work at the cross. Believe in His resurrection. Believe in all that He said, all the miracles that were performed, and the promises that are yet to come. Yes, that's all the Lord calls us to do, is to look unto Him for salvation. Just look. Doesn't require works, doesn't require performance, but simply to look. To have that humble spirit that says, Oh Lord, don't take your presence from me. I know you can't even look upon sin, let alone have a relationship. But there I am, a sinner, a poor, begging, lost, self destructing, self loving sinner who needs your grace, who needs your spirit, Lord, to make my crooked way straight. Yep. That's what a Christian does. That's how we approach God. We, we are, no matter what status you have in life, no matter what your background is, no matter what your, your race or, you know, wherever, rich or poor, you know, all shapes and sizes, that's how you come to the Lord. And the way that I would want to finish up is if you just think about, um, if you go to Isaiah... And we'll go to Isaiah, what, 51, as I recall. You can... Actually, it's Isaiah 55. You can use one word for the gospel, by the way. Come. It says in Isaiah 55, Come, everyone who thirsts. Come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. The Lord is saying, come. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labors for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Hear that your soul may live. And I'm going to stop right there. So what I'm, the way I'm ending this message is this way. The Lord is saying, come to him, all right? But it's not about your sincerity, all right? It's about actually coming to the living Lord. It's not about your feelings, all right? It's not about the way you think God should save men, women, and children, all right? In other words, it's not about, like, the Lord isn't saying, come to anybody, come to any idol, come to any idea that makes you feel good. He's saying, come to me. He's very clear. Come to me and hear that your soul may live. Come to the God who is capable of saving you, capable of giving you eternal life, capable of satisfying all your needs, no matter what is happening within your life. Because ultimately what you and I both need is forgiveness of our sins, We need life. We need somebody who's capable of conquering death. And it is this God, the God who made heaven and earth, the God who came, humbled himself and came as a babe and grew up to wear a cross for you and I. A God who has the power to speak life into existence, uh, has the power of taking something corrupt like, like our souls and making us new again. You see, that is the gospel. Come. Not just come to anybody, but come to the living God. Seek Him earnestly. Um, As Jeremiah says, right? Come to the living and true God. And do not let this distraction of this world get in your way or, or any other folly or any other idol. Push them out of your way, my friend, and come to the living God. And, um, and so I, I hope this has been a blessing to you. I hope that we can finally break the bondage of a legal temp- temperament and embrace a gospel temperament by trusting in what God is actually saying. We get down to the very heart of it, don't we? That biblical assurance is based on actually trusting God. And, and that is the best way that I can say it. So I'm going to stop right here. Well, until next time, 
grace upon grace be with you all. 